It ain't the left side or the right side. And it must be the fin side. Inside. It ain't the left side. Thank you, Solo right D, side. and welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side. Here with Brian Cat, Captain Zero, and Paul Pickin, recapping the Miami Dolphins' victory, sloppy victory, but a victory nonetheless over the Cleveland Browns by a score of 30 to 24. The Dolphins moved to one and two on the year. Definitely a nail biter, an unexpected nail biter uh, here to, to, for, for the Miami Dolphins to get their first win. You can join us on Facebook, on Twitter. You can subscribe to our channel on iTunes, on YouTube, or you can tweet your questions. Questions with hashtag FinsideQ. Paul, it uh, looks like after the Browns game, before we get into this, Arian Foster, Jordan Cameron, Mike Pouncey look like they're going to be out for the Bengals game as well. Maybe it's addition by subtraction at this point. As long as Anthony Steen's healthy, I have no concern about Mike Pouncey's return timetable. Um, you could see in the second half of this game, and I know we'll get to it a little more later, when Steen went out, the protections on that line really collapsed. And that's pretty telling of, of the impact that he has, not just in terms of his blocking, but also in calling out protections along that line. I'm getting more and more in the camp that an aging Pro Bowl center with a nagging hip injury might be expendable when he returns. And then, you know, Arian Foster, none of us have been impressed with our running game at all thus far. So that's not a huge loss. And Jordan Cameron, he had that good game against the Patriots. Looked like he might have been starting out to have a good game in this one and then mysteriously disappeared with a concussion that I can't even tell you when it occurred. So, yeah, I'm not hurt by any of that. Yeah, and we'll get to a little bit later. Deion Sims and his and Cameron's place had four catches for 46 yards. I think he may end up actually being a more well-rounded player than Jordan Cameron. So, yeah, I, you know, I look at Arian Foster, Jordan Cameron, Mike Pouncey for the reasons you described. To me, very overrated football players and ones that looking at our roster right now, I, I don't think I'd be disappointed if they weren't here next year. There's a lot of expendable parts on the Miami Dolphins roster as we saw this past Sunday. Paul, let's get into the game. You know, I, this is one that I expected the Dolphins to come out and win big. We, You predicted a big win. I did. Um, you know, our Browns guest even did from last week. And, uh, you know, Dolphins come out, and Cameron Wake forces a fumble. They get the ball, march right down the field, a, a touchdown pass to Devontae Parker to put the Dolphins up 7 nothing halfway through the first quarter. We're thinking, okay, you know, we're going to win this big. They have both their quarterbacks out. Corey Coleman, Josh Gordon out, Joe, Joe Hayden out promising defensive end Carl Nass about. Uh, and then from that point, the Dolphins are down 10-7 to 7 at halftime. And then they come back, and then at the end of the third quarter, they're up 24-13. to 13. Looks like the Dolphins are starting to pull away with the football game uh, until the Browns come back with two long scores. And uh, – we get into overtime and it's 24 to 24 and we're looking at losing 27 to 24 to the Browns until the kicker, Corey Parkey misses his third field goal of the game. And the dolphins come back and thanks to a, an 11 yard touchdown run capped off by, by JJ, the dolphins to come away with a 30 to 24 win. You know, Paul doesn't really seem like a victory. No, it, it feels a hell of a lot more like the Browns lost than it does the Miami Dolphins won. They had a lot of problems. They got exposed a lot in this game. Granted, the Dolphins had a few injuries as well, but nothing near as devastating as what should have already been an inferior team on paper had. And to add to that, Cody Kessler played most of the game pretty banged up in the beating he was taking early on from the defensive line. So they should have been able to just absolutely feast on these guys. And yeah, the Browns pulled out some, some trickery. They pulled out some wild caddish type stuff with, Terrell Pryor. They pulled out a few different odd stunts and stuff on defense, but really the Dolphins should have been able to manhandle these guys. And I applaud Adam Gates for coming out this week and basically saying, do your job or I'll find somebody who will, because that needs to happen regardless of talent level at this point. You know, looking at the Browns at offense, it should have been very, very, very clear from the outset that there was one player you had to stop, and that was Terrell Pryor. And not even a player that's lit the world on fire. Here's Terrell Pryor, eight catches for 144 yards, takes some snaps at quarterback, uh, you know, throws for 35 yards, rushes for 21, had an all-world fantasy football game. It should have been so obvious 
that you stock the line of scrimmage, you force them to beat you by throwing the football and uh, breaking big runs. Instead, the Dolphins play too far back in the secondary again. Their linebackers were pathetic. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, um, I give kudos to Adam Gase. At least we're seeing a big change, Paul, from 2007 when the Dolphins score on a Greg Camarillo 60 yard touchdown and storm the field, which I thought was pretty, pretty much the most embarrassing moment of being a Dolphins fan when, when you're celebrating a, a one in 13 like that. But yeah, it's, it, it was definitely a disappointing outcome here. So let's get a little bit more into what you said there, Paul. Uh, Adam Gase did come out today and basically said, Hey, listen, if, you know, I'm, I'm tired of talking about uh, uh, where the lack of production is. Bottom line is talent is irrelevant at this point. And he's right. And talent is irrelevant at this point. And, and if you're not going to do your job, he's going to find somebody that will. The first one that seems to have gotten that message was right tackle Juwan James. Billy Turner was playing the the last part of the fourth quarter and overtime in place of Juwan James. Do you, do you intend on that continuing? Um, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, some of that's going to depend upon the injuries along the offensive line this week. But I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I know I said in the preseason it would come as a lot of surprise and not be a popular opinion among folks. But Jawan James just was doing okay in the preseason. He wasn't setting the world on fire. And he was making a lot of mistakes as well. So it, it's there wasn't really anything special about what he was doing out there, which if you're not doing anything special, there's always a chance somebody can unseat you. And if you have a bad game and you're really not being anything special, that's a hell of a lot lower bad game than it is for somebody that's going to do special things. I know that sounds confusing, but I wouldn't be shocked. Billy Turner Juwan. is definitely a better run blocker than Juwan James. Juwan might have a little bit of pass protection, but he sure as hell didn't show it this week against a backup defensive lineman for the Cleveland Browns. So I wouldn't be shocked at all if Billy Turner takes over the spot. Yeah, if Juwan James isn't pass protecting well, then you should put Billy Turner in there because my understanding is that's all Juwan James is supposed to be good at. He's not great in the run game. He's not very big. He's not very mean. He looks like just that big decent right tackle but you you look at the Browns game Paul he goes he goes up against players like Tyrone Holmes and Corey Lemonois uh, players who were cut from the Jaguars and the 49ers they go out there they absolutely eat his lunch in the most important parts of the game we'll get to that a little bit later as, as we go down the list and talk about the grades from the Dolphins Browns game let's start out at the quarterback position Paul definitely an up and down game from Ryan Tannehill the stat line looks pretty good at the end of the game and the Dolphins uh, come away with it how would you analyze Ryan Tannehill's uh, production in this game? There was good and bad. Like you said, there was ups and downs. That first interception was horrible. And the second interception that he had, he got drilled as he threw it. So, uh, yeah, he threw a floater. Guy picked it off, ran it back for a touchdown. At least he gave his all to try to stop him from getting in the end zone, even though that was kind of a moot point when he when he lay a pretty good hit on him there. But I was okay with Tannehill's production in this game, even though I don't love it. I know he was my stud the last two weeks. Give you a sneak preview. He's not going to be this week. I'd give him a. Uh, I'm right on the cusp of a B minus and a C plus, but I'll give him the B minus. And I would have liked to see him run a little bit more because I didn't see any read option come in to try to put that defense on their heels a little bit. And Paul and I do our grades beforehand so that we're not piggybacking off each other. Paul, you give him a B minus. I'm going to give him a C plus. Uh, you know, a very up and down. Yes. That that first interception to uh, to Kenny uh, throw on to Kenny Stills. Stills maybe could have run the route a little through a little bit more, but either way it would have been a contested pass. Um, and of all people, Jamar Taylor picks the ball off first pass thrown in Hard Rock Stadium is picked off by Jamar Taylor, who is a, a liability here in Miami for several years, did not have an interception with with us, but he does with the Cleveland Browns on Ryan Tannehill's first attempt, and then. Yeah, I, I know that the interception return for touchdown, he was hit as he threw. It was a terrible job by both Juwan James and, and Jay Ajayi on that play. But you've got to see that coming at least to the point where you're not just floating the ball into the middle of the defense. I, I think he does share some blame in that, too. And, you know, when the Dolphins go up 24-13, to 13, the Browns come back and score. And now Adam Gase puts the ball in Tannehill's hands. He doesn't say run the clock down. And then over those next couple drives, he goes 6-13, for 13 for 50 yards uh, and a fumble at the end of the fourth quarter. You know, I, I'm, I give him a C plus because 
He did put up some yards, and it was a great throw to Jarvis Landry uh, at the end of overtime that put the Dolphins in a position to win the game. It was a great play action, put the ball right in there. Jarvis Landry springs free. There were some good things, but, man, oh, man, I, I look at this and say, why is it every single time that the pressure is on during this during Tannehill's tenure, he seems to fold. I'm glad that he did complete that last pass, though. I'm going to give him a C plus. Paul, uh, I think it could be an understatement to say this was a running back by committee this week against the Browns. Yeah, it was. I was glad, like I said. I mean, I wanted to see Tannehill run some read options. I was glad he wasn't the leading rusher in this game. Now, Kenny and Drake, I thought looked really good. Isaiah Pete, I didn't see as much as I expected, but again, he's coming back off being out for several weeks with an injury, so you know he might need a little bit of time to get rolling. And Jay Jai throughout most of the game didn't look like a guy that was trying to reclaim his starting job. He looked mediocre at best, and I, I have to give him a little credit because he did have that really good run at the end of the game and over time to steal it away. But I don't know. We need to get this the, the running backs moving. And I saw several plays where there was a huge pileup on the line and Ajayi or whoever happened to be in there ran smack into the pile, not even to the two holes in either direction. So I got to give these guys a C minus. They're not showing much sign of improvement, and that's a position of concern. Wow. Um, I'm going to give them a B, and I'll tell you why. Because, yeah, it was a running back by committee completely, but I look at that committee, and combined they had 22 rushes for 97 yards, which is almost four and a half yards of carry. You know, I I actually like that committee approach. I was impressed a bit by Kenyon Drake. I I, I think he's got a lot of springiness to him. Yeah, Isaiah Pede didn't have many holes to run through. Um, had only had five rushes for 17 yards. Damian Williams had a big run and a big catch too. So nothing, nothing that really uh, was amazing with what the running backs did. But combined, hey, if you're telling me that every week that that conclusively that they're going to have 90 or you know 22 carries for 97 yards, 4.4 yards a carry, I'm going to take that every day of the week. I'm going to give them a B. Uh, the receiving unit, Paul. Uh, you know, it seems like we go back every week, and it looks like this is emerging as one of the staples of the team. Oh, absolutely! And Jarvis Landry is just on fire right now, and you can you can see him out on the field trying to take even more on his shoulders, even to somewhat of a ridiculous point at times. But Kenny Stills got back into the act a little bit this week. Uh, he had five catches for neighborhood of 75, 76 yards, which was awesome to see. I know a lot of people were down on stills after week one, justifiably so. And then you look at Devontae Parker. He continues to build his rapport with Ryan Tannehill. It looks great out there doing it. And you can see that even though he kind of screwed up in that last play in the New England game, it didn't seem to phase him this week. He made some very athletic plays, got himself open, and Deion Sims even got into the act after Jordan Cameron went out with concussion number 478. So it's nice to see all of these cylinders clicking in the receiving core. And I'll actually give these guys an A-. minus. They, they really carried what there was to carry in this game. Yeah, I mean, Devontae Parker disappeared in the second half. He may have been injured. Paul, do you have any knowledge of that? Was Parker injured in the second in the second half? Uh, there were no reports of him leaving the game with an injury. Yeah, he, he disappeared a little bit. First first half though, uh, three catches for fifty one yards, and, and that big touchdown that, that really put the Dolphins up seven to nothing. And yeah, I, I mean, I'll say a few things about Landry and Parker. To me, th- this is the best thing going on with the Miami Dolphins roster right now. Uh, Jarvis Landry, if you, if you include, include his rushing yards, he is second in the league in yard in in rushing or, or excuse me in receiving and, and rushing yards for a wide receiver behind only Marvin Jones of the Lions. So you've got that Devontae Parker three for fifty one and a touchdown after over a hundred last game. If you take Devontae Parker's last eight games, not taking any of them out, he has uh six hundred and one yards. So you multiply by two, you've got over twelve hundred yards projected over an entire season. And it, not to mention this kid has been playing inexperienced. He's been playing hurt this year. Yeah, and yeah, Kenny Stills did wake up more this this week uh toward the end of the first quarter he caught that long pass or excuse me at the end of the first half the last uh, catches a long pass he should have shoveled it back to jarvis landry i actually think landry could have taken it to the house but you know uh, i'm glad that he's starting to showcase his talent starting to show a little bit more consistency and i agree with you too paul i mean Deion sims four catches 46 yards i i argue to say blocking and receiving wise that might be the best the, the best performance by a tight end we've seen uh, this year and maybe even last year too. 
So overall, when looking at the receivers and tight ends, I'm I'm going to give them I'm going to give them a B plus. Uh, the offensive line, you know, again, going back, Billy Turner takes over in overtime for Juwan James, does a good job, is obviously better in the rocking department. Uh, how do you rate the rest of the offensive line in this game? Yeah, the offensive line for me, they, they were interesting at times in this game. They they weren't the best in pass blocking, as can be seen by Juwan James being benched, by Billy Turner coming in. Anthony Steen went down with an injury, which after he went down really seemed to hamper the offensive line, so I can only imagine that something along the line in the protection calls, because you look at the right side of the line, they got noticeably worse when Steen came out of the game. Something with the protection calls, possibly Arabic. Daniel got sacked, I believe it was four times, and got hit on a number of other plays, including the strip sack at the end of the game, where he didn't have time to throw that ball. And then on the intercept, on one of the interceptions he threw early, so there's a lot of issues. Like I said, I wasn't impressed with the, what the running game was able to establish and the fact that there were a lot of pileups along that line and holes that got closed up. For me, I've got to give the line a, a, I got to give them a C here, and, and I might be being generous on this one. I'll go with the C plus. Yeah, I, you nailed a lot of it. The run blocking wasn't all that good, which you know, and I I don't expect it to be all that great. You know, the Dolphins have on their offensive line a center and they have four left tackles and that's okay because I, in fact, I, I like that they're emphasizing pass protection, especially with Ryan Tannehill. But my expectation is that the team has some routes going downfield consistently and they're not playing in this box. That's the advantage of having a good pass protection offensive line that you can have these routes develop more. And I haven't seen that over the last uh, a couple of games. The only time I saw it is when they were getting their butts kicked by the Patriots and they had to come to come back. I'm thinking, why don't you play like that all the time? <laughs> um, but getting back to the game, yeah, Juwan James, I, to me, had the worst game I've ever seen him play. Um, had had a penalty, gave up two sacks, very easily could have been more, and obviously he wasn't very strong in, in the run game either. Um, Anthony Steen goes down. Hopefully we, we get him back this week against uh, against the Bengals because Mike Pouncey's not expected to be back. I thought Bushrod at right guard did fine. And Brandon Albert at left tackle, you know, uh, how often do you hear that Tannehill's hit from the blind side? Hardly any times this year. Laramie Tunzel, good game, has, has not a lot of sack this year, has let up a few pressures, needs to get better at the stunt, but not a lot of push from the running game. And Juwan James at right tackle uh, was a nightmare in this one. So, I'm going to go with a. I'm going to go with a C plus. Uh, defensive, defensively, Paul, it was an absolute train wreck. So let's divvy out the blame on this one, starting with the defensive line. I, I think the defensive line was very low on the totem pole blame overall. I, I thought they did a pretty decent job of putting pressure, especially when Cody Kessler was in there. I mean, they they left him battered several times throughout the game where it looked like the Browns went to more of a wildcat formation because they needed to give Kessler a breather on the sidelines. But they did bite a little bit extra hard on the wildcat, but I thought Mario Williams definitely was good in pass rush situations and even in some of the running situations. Jason Jones, I thought, had a good game. And Dominican Sue was okay. I mean, he, he didn't blow me away in this one, but I thought he did all right. I liked what I saw Jordan Phillips. Andre Branch really showed up to me for almost the first time this year. Chris Jones is an absolute dumpster fire on that line, and I guess he's my Jordan Cameron in the defense at this point. But all in all, I, I really thought the defensive line did well. I thought they put some pressure on Kessler, and unfortunately, the, the, the corners weren't able to keep where the defensive line could have got a few extra sacks there because they weren't able to keep coverage because they were so far off the ball. So I don't attribute that to the defensive line. I'll give them a B plus, believe it or not. B plus is exactly what I had too. I, I'm with you, Paul. I, I think it'd be too easy to look at the defense and say, well, the defensive line gets paid all this much. Defense isn't good, so therefore we shouldn't have spent all this money. No, I thought Cameron Wake and Dominic can sue Mario Williams and, and even Jordan Phillips and Andre Branch all did their job. I mean, uh, and I'll even go a step further. I thought Hindamick and Sue and Cameron Roy, I, I have to relook at those plays where they were called offside. I thought they beat the snap down. And if so, on one of them, Cameron Wake had a had a, another forced fumble because he jumped the staff against Austin Pastor for the Browns. And uh, the Dolphins would have <laughs> would have had the ball and the Browns 20 up 11 points in the fourth quarter. Instead, the Browns get the ball back, they score only down by three and end up sending the game into overtime. Interesting how things like that make a difference. Yeah, Mario Williams was in there. He 
he, he's getting a little bit of a rough reputation, but I, I, I don't agree with that. Um, and it, it seems like all, all the blame was to me is, is should be placed on the back seven. I'm going to give them a B plus, uh, the linebacker position, Paul, um, a lot of injuries in this game. No, not a surprise. Uh, what do you make of this unit as, as we continue to move forward in the year and, and how do you grade them in the game against Cleveland? God, I was, I mean, it's, I almost feel like we should be grading them individually at this point. I actually, I actually thought Kiko was all right in this game. Comisia in the left the game with an injury and, and didn't really come back. So he's not really in the mix here. Johnny Jenkins had a very up and down game, more down than up. And I believe it was him that would have had a scoop and score if, uh, Things hadn't been called back in ridiculous fashion. But we'd probably be bumping them up at about a half grade at that point. Neville Hewitt, I thought, looked very good when he was in there. And Donald Butler looked like he had some rust. So it's it's there were up and down performances all throughout this unit. For me, uh, they need to get better. They absolutely do. They need more consistent. need to get healthy because health was one of the biggest concerns that we raised going into the year and, and throughout. And I think all three linebackers exited the game, or no, I'm sorry, two two of the three linebackers exited the game at some point for various reasons. So I got to go with a C minus here. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, and this is a very hapless team. And they need not really go out that whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's even generous. I'm I'm going to give them a D and uh, a couple of things there. Yeah, I think Koamisi has played fine this year when he's been on the field. Either he's not on the field because he's subbed out, you know, for a third cornerback, or I don't know what's going on. But Jelani Jenkins, I mean, as one of, as somebody who has been a, one of the biggest Jelani Jenkins fans over the last couple of years, he has been just putrid this year. I mean, not even good in pass defense. I mean, you, you look at that at that 30 yard throw to Gary Barnage from Terrell Pryor. Really in the game, uh, instead of, of following Barnage up the field, Jenkins takes the you know the, the dump off pass in the slot or, or in the flat that probably would have been covered anyway. Um, and he's bad enough against the run. So Jelani Jenkins, man, oh man, I'm I'm not on his side anymore. Uh, Kiko Alonso, again, somebody I was actually really excited to get him on the team. Another atrocious game at middle linebacker. Yeah, I I mean the first game against Seattle, I thought he added a lot of speed to the middle of the defense. Over the last two games. Games, I feel he is a big reason why the Dolphins get gashed up the middle so often. Um, yeah, Neville Hewitt, this is your time, Neville Hewitt, to step up now because the opportunity is there. I want to see the same Neville Hewitt uh, the rest of the season that I saw in the last two games last year when he was trying to prove something. Donald Butler was an absolute nightmare. Uh, you look at that 30 yard run by Isaiah Crowell when the Dolphins had the Browns backed up late in the game. You'll see Butler getting smacked in the mouth. You'll see him losing track of Gary Barnage a little bit later in that drive. I mean, he accounted for 50, 60 yards in that drive. Terrible, terrible, terrible right now. I'm hoping Zach Vigil, when he comes back after week six, that he can throw his hat in the ring and, and give the Dolphins some help. So, Kat, let me ask you a quick question here. Just This just sort of occurred to me. Week one, when Jelani Jenkins was possibly going to be out, the top name to replace him was concretely Spencer Pacer. A lot of linebackers going down in this game, a lot of subs coming in and out. I, I didn't see Pacinger on the field. What do you make of that? Well, my understanding is Pacinger was hurt in this past game, and, and he didn't he didn't dress. That That's my understanding. So, yeah, I mean, when it, when it comes to Spencer Pacinger, I, I think that you've at least got to got to rotate him in a little bit. I, I Whenever he's been on the field, I don't think he's been great. Um, I think he's been uh, an experienced body out there that doesn't stand out, but sometimes that could be a good thing. So if, if, if he wants to step up at any time, th- th- this is his opportunity right now. Let's see if he practices this week and if he gets a little bit more action on Thursday against the Bengals. Looking, uh, so I'm going to give that, yeah, I'm going to give the unit a D. Uh, last week I gave them an F at, at the linebacker court. I mean, look, uh, when it, you look at the Browns in this game, Duke Johnson and Isaiah Crowell, 25 carries, 148 yards, almost six yards a carry, running right between the tackle, punching you right in the mouth. Man, oh man, if they don't get if they don't get that figured out, it's going to be a long season because I and I can't blame the defensive line for that because the defensive line to me is doing at least a good enough job tying up blocks in run defense. They can't make all the stops themselves. The linebackers have to fill in, and they are very clearly not doing it. This is a unit that to me is is almost is. One of the most troublesome units on the team. I would say the most, but defensive back also is not looking very good right now. Uh, Paul, taking a look at at the secondary, 
How do you think they fared against the Browns? How do you grade them? This is an odd one. I mean, they again, like we talked about last week and the week before that and the week before that, the corners started out not being put in position to succeed. Um, they're playing too far off the ball in most cases. The defensive scheme is not being adjusted based on what the opponents are doing. And that puts them behind the eight ball to start with. On top of that, you look at Byron Maxwell, he had a pretty rough game. Uh, Xavier Howard, uh, he could have had at least a decent stat line after the game if he managed to catch that ball that hit him right in the hands at perfect level early in the game. He did end up with a forced fumble and a couple of tackles. I thought he played all right in this game. He came up and made some stops. Not great. Terrell Pryor ate a lot of people's lunches you, you were putting in a few minutes ago um, in this game. I will say Rashad Jones continued to have an outstanding season thus far. He is sitting in the middle of the secondary being branded with the collective unit, and it's really unfair to this guy because he is, he is lights out. I believe he had 10 tackles, a half sack, almost managed to jump up and take the ball right out of Castro's hands on a blitz. Just absolutely lights out. I thought Bobby McCain had some okay moments when he was out there. Um, I didn't see anything quite like the screw up he had at the end of the game in Seattle. But they, they've got to do something in the secondary the, this coming off season, or maybe when Pouncey's healthy again, uh, because it, it it does have its rough moments. But I'm not sure even replacing guys is going to yield success if they're not being put in position to succeed. So I'll give them a which are great. I'll give them a C, but I wasn't impressed. Yeah, I'm, I'll go with uh, I'm going to go with a with a C minus in, in this contest. Couple a few things if we can go down those. I agree with you. Rashad Jones has been phenomenal by no means the problem. And Adam Gase even even singled him out today and said if everybody played as well and with as much passion as Rashad Jones, we'd have a great team. Uh, Isa Abdul Qudis, I thought, had a little bit of a rough game, uh, but you know, I, he, he's not the big problem to me, and and he still adds a lot of speed to the middle of that defense. Uh, he he gave up a, lar- a long uh, pass to to Ricardo Lewis. He almost knocked it down. Turned out to be a big play. But overall, I I, I still think that guy can play at the corner spots. Xavier Howard, man, oh man, what a disappointment. Dolphins are up seven to nothing. Uh, Terrell Pryor comes in there, throws the ball. Uh, Xavier Howard has the easiest interception you can get. It almost looked like a pick at one point. Would have been his first career pick. Who knows how much that would have taken the wind out of the sails of Terrell Pryor. If I had to guess, 80 to 100 of them uh, came came on Byron Maxwell, especially a late game one where where he catches a 40 yard pass. Byron Maxwell is just out there, just out to lunch on the island, and, and Pryor cuts across the field, breaks another tackle from Abdul Kudis, and, and goes down the sideline, and, and before you know it, the Dolphins are uh, are, are fighting for their lives. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you look at a few players the Dolphins could have had in free agency, even, not even Prince of Mucamore or these high-ticket guys, but Casey Hayward's a player I wanted, and you look at San Diego, he's got three interceptions through three games. We need a professional out there, a cornerback, uh, and and more of them. I think Howard's going to be a good player. He and to me, Maxwell has been worse than the rookie Xavier Howard up to this point. But this back seven is flat out scary, and they almost cost the Dolphins a game. And I think they did cost them the game against New England. So uh, I'm going to give this unit a C minus. Um, special teams, Paul. Honestly, I didn't see too many plays that our special teams had an impact in the game outside of Matt Dar. Andrew Franks was serviceable again. Matt Dar, I thought, did a phenomenal job yet again, which is unfortunate to be able to say. I mean, I think their special teams were more notable in this game than, than ours were. So yeah, I, I, I'll give them a B for participation. Well, I'm going to give them an A-. I mean, I had no problems with, a, with what they did on special teams. Uh, uh, kickoff returns, they, the Browns had three of them. The longest was 21 yards. Matt Dar not only bombed the ball, but didn't even have any returned. <laughs> so when you look at Matt Dar and punting, to me, this made a significant difference in the game. He punted six times, uh, had, a, had, a, had a net average of 48.8 on those six punts. If this guy's not going to the Pro Bowl, I'd like to see who is. 
at the point in the season. Jakeem Grant had one return for 27 yards. Can't argue with that. Landry had a 13-yard punt return. So uh, I think that Darren Rizzi's group definitely did a good job in this. I'm going to give him an A-. minus. Paul, when you look overall at the Dolphins and, and this 30-24 to 24 sloppy win, who would you say was the stud for the Miami Dolphins' 45-man a- active roster? That one's easy for me. Um, he had one, sack, one strip sack, should have been two, and really was all over the place. Cam Wake. And I love that he got his snaps this week and we didn't see as stupid of a defensive rotation on that line. For me, Cam Wake takes his hands down. He he single-handedly could have turned the tide of that game, especially if he was given the credit he should have because I saw the same thing you did. He just jumped that snap perfectly. Then, yeah, he'd easily be the stud of the game with Rashad Jones being a runner-up. Yeah, very easily. One sack could have been two sacks and two forced fumbles. Maybe even could have been more sacks. So uh, you look at the right tackles, Cameron Wake's going to be fading here. If we can keep that snap count at 30 or 35, I, I, I think you're going to see incredible performance. I mean, maybe he can be around two or three more years, even though he's 35 already. Uh, my Paul, my stud for the game is going to be Jarvis Landry, the wide receiver. Seven catches, 120 yards, and... Uh, uh, you look at the two real big plays of the game for Miami on offense. He beats double coverage going over the middle when Ryan Tan is well protected, catches it, dodges a tackle, goes to the end zone for 40 yards. And then in the final play of the game, or the second to last play of the game, Landry gets loose, catches a pass, uh, is physical and, and, and putting his shoulder down and hitting the defensive back before he goes out of bounds. And then by that point, the Dolphins, unless Andrew Franks was going to shake a kick, um, had that game won. Dolphins uh, may have to pony up for him, even if it's 12 or 13 million a year, Jarvis Landry, and do it as consistently. Uh, Paul, who's your dud of the game? Again, this is another easy layup. Um, somebody I mentioned in the preseason could potentially get surprisingly benched given the play of the other linemen. John James is the Dolphins get the ball back with a chance to come and win it. And instead, he allows a backup defensive lineman to smoke him and get the strip sack, potentially putting the Browns in field goal position. And luckily, fingers crossed, the, the, the Browns had Parkey, who had already missed two in the game, had his chance for redemption and sailed wide left yet again. So I give it to Juwan James. He almost single-handedly cost the, the game despite all the flubs earlier on in the game. And he actually got smoked by two backup pass rushers throughout the game. But yeah, that last one that you referred to uh, um, should have done the Dolphins in. I mean, Dolphins should have lost this game. And and that's sad to say, but at the end of the day, uh, a win, I'm happy. A loss, I'm not happy. So let's hope in the short week the Dolphins can do this. My, my dud's going to be Kiko Alonso. I... I yeah, to me, it's feast or famine with this guy. In pass defense, he adds a lot of speed to the middle of the defense. But there, when you look at a big run up the middle, you always see Kiko getting caught in the wash. Uh, I, I don't like how frequently Vance Joseph is blitzing Jelani Jenkins and Kiko Alonso because I think it takes them out of their game. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know how this run defense is going to get fixed, and, and Kiko is a big part of that. And you look at Terrell Pryor's touchdown run uh, that – that put the the Browns within five and eventually three. See Kiko Alonso just do an embarrassing job of shadowing Terrell Pryor when we know that he's probably just going to take the ball and run it right to the outside, and that's what he did. So Kiko's got to pick it up. It's it's definitely hit or miss with him. Um, um, so Paul, uh, we've got taking a look at the rest of the schedule. Uh, you know, we've uh, there's a big game on Thursday against Cincinnati. If the Dolphins can get to two and two, the schedule starts to lighten up between. If the Dolphins can pull off the upset against Cincinnati, go two and two, then and then throughout these four games at home, go three and one. And now we're starting to talk about a season that might be a little bit of fun. But the Dolphins have to pick it up. Adam Gase has been the one that said so himself. So that'll do it for us here on the Fin side. And as Brian Miller used to say, if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it's on the Fin side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side. And it must be the fin side. side. It ain't the left side, left side. or the right, right side. side. And it must be the fin side. Left. Listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian, Cat, and Paul about to do again. We rep our team, you can't change, stop or ruin it. All we need is to figure what to do to win. Fins radio, live and direct. Win or lose, we're showing up for every contest. No puppet talk, it's all raw and unfiltered. Voice of the fans when the season looks peculiar. Rockin' Apple Orange over here, then you familiar. Every week they coming through our speakers.
to fulfill the crap we have to hear about our team and all the latest news. Vets, the rookies trying to make the team paying dues. Current players and alumni interviews. City to city, state to state, follow the moves. Call the hotline, Dolphins talk, set to go. Best sports team and show all across the globe. Fin ain't the left side.